All right, today is June 1st. It's our uh, weekly DAP Network governance call. I'm kicking this thing off. Um, I guess, so we posted the draft for the Bancor whitelist proposal um, over the weekend. So that's where I'd like to focus a lot of the conversation because everything else that needed to happen to make the Bancor proposal possible has happened um, over the last few weeks. We've approved all of the initial uh, governance steps as far as proposals that need to happen. We have um, the official recognition of um, the DAD bridge and the DAP ERC-20 contract as the official contract um, that we'll be using for the rewards program. Um, we reached a consensus on um, increasing the DAP network inflation as a way to fund liquidity incentives, IL protection, grants, bounties, and basically everything that we decide um, as a community to do through this governance process. And then most recently, I guess it just got approved since yesterday, the third party staking for DSP services also just got approved. We could talk about that a little bit, but I, I mostly want to focus on the bank or white listing because at this point we have the inflation uh, approved. Um, I, we're working on it, uh, the contracts uh, with liquid ops internally to um, get those changes made and then we'll, they'll be implemented by the uh, guardian. So there'll be a process because the code's going to need to be reviewed once it's finished. And then the custodians will hopefully approve it quickly. Um, if we get 50% of the custodians to sign off on it, which we shouldn't have a problem with once it's uh, up for signing, then it should kick in immediately. Um, I don't have a timeline on that right this second, but it's it's being worked on. Um, and that, that was really the only thing holding left holding back the proposal to Bancor because the proposal to Bancor, it doesn't need to specify specific like exact amounts of rewards. It's really just stating that we're going to offer liquidity incentives. Like it's it's very broad. Um, but as we get closer to proposing the Bancor um, whitelist proposal officially, like to their gov, whenever it's up for vote, we will need to push through a proposal on our side that explicitly states how much. Um, DAP is going towards the rewards pool. So set aside the impermanent loss protection pool because that's that's going to actually get a lot of um, the early inflation because the impermanent loss protection account, like through the modeling, like we're going to need to pad that probably th over the next six months or so. That should probably have 30 to 50 million DAPs at least in there. Uh, to provide impermanent loss protection to around 100 million or more DAPs in the Bancor pool. Um, so that that's where a lot of it's going to go, but we need to determine, that's what I, I kind of want to start some of this conversation around is deciding how many DAPs, and we could allocate them every 30 days, every, yeah, 30 days would be fine. So like coming up with like a budget of like how many DAPs should be directed towards rewards only. So set aside IO and just the rewards alone, the liquidity mining rewards alone on Bancor, because it, this is a unique situation um, compared to most liquidity mining, because most liquidity mining does not offer the IL protection and do, don't have the single side staking in the BNT co-investment. So what I mean by that is, um, let's assume we, created a liquidity incentive for DeFi box. DeFi box allows an unlimited, like you could add as much EOS and DAP as you want to DeFi box. So if we set um, a DAP reward amount for DeFi box, it might start off at 100%, 200%, whatever it is. If it's a new project, it could be in the thousands of percent. But over time, as more liquidity gets added to the pool, it just eventually dilutes itself down to whatever the market can bear. The market decides what yield is worth um, worth it to keep adding to the liquidity pool. Once the yield drops to a certain level, you notice that liquidity stops being added to the pool and the yield balances out. Um, but with Bancor, it's kind of unique because um, with the single-sided pools, there's a cap to how much single-sided DAP, at least, 
can be added to the pool. So for everyone who um, had a chance to take a look at the whitelist proposal, you saw it's asking for a co-investment of 500,000 BNT, which is between two and two and a half million dollars. Um, so that it, it's able to match a lot of debt. What that means is basically BNT, should their DAO approve this, Bancor is going to print 500,000 BNT tokens and stake them into their half of the liquidity pool. And then we as the community are responsible for staking the two to two and a half million dollars of DAP on the other side. Once um, we hit our cap there, which at the current prices, it is going to be about 90 million, 800,000 DAP if nothing changed from today. Um, once, once we have that much DAP in the pool, like more DAP cannot be added unless more BNT also gets added, um, which some DAP holders might also own BNT, which you'd be able to stake into the pool just like a regular liquidity pool, like a two-sided pool. Or if you get single-sided BNT stakes, then someone with DAP could stake single-sided, assuming that there's room in the pool. But what's unique is that like even if we get additional staking, because I know I've talked to some of you guys before, and I know some of you guys have decent BNT holdings, so you can stake two-sided. But I, I just am assuming that the majority of the stake is going to be the single-sided. So if our cap is 91 million dApps in the pool with the 500k BNT, and that's at current prices, so that is subject to change also, um, that we might get I don't know, 10, 20% more from two-sided stakes. Uh, it's really impossible to predict at this point. But the fact of the matter is that we know roughly how much DAP is going to be in the pool. So because of that, we have a predictable amount of tokens. So whatever amount of rewards we're setting that are going to be directed towards that pool, it's basically like we're determining what the APR is going to be. Because if you have... 90 million 800,000 daps and you put for example um what oh, hold on, i got my spreadsheet in front of me um if you put 3 million daps into like the monthly budget and you say okay 3 million daps are going to go into the bancor rewards pool every 30 days so then every 30 days so the inflation would accumulate on EOS because that's where the debt services contract is. It would accumulate an account. And then every 30 days, it would say, okay, I'm going to take 3 million DAPs and I'm going to send them to the Bancor rewards contract for the DAP LPs. So if we say 3 million DAPs is our monthly budget and there's 90 million 800,000 DAPs in the LP, then for the single-sided DAP stakers, that's, for example, 39.41% APR. So what I mean is like it's a predictable number because we know within probably 10 or 20 percent how many DAP tokens are going to be in the pool. Like and, and we know what the we know we're going to fill the single sided cap. So at a minimum, we'll have 90 million, 800 thousand DAP and we might have a few million more depending on BNT stakes on top of that. So what we need to decide as a community is what should these liquidity what what's enough of an incentive to be willing to um cross the bridge, pay some gas fees, stake your tokens, lock your tokens uh, with a time locking mechanism. Um, what is a good amount that is not going to, I guess, be too much or too little? It, it's really hard because typically with DeFi, it has, DeFi is a way of sorting itself out. Like the market decides what, it, what, like I said at the beginning, the market decides what the yield should be. Like people stop depositing into the pool if it's too too low. And they'll deposit more if it's if it's high and good. Um, but since we ha we know almost exactly what we're going to get in the pool as far as the DAP tokens, um, we have a predictive yield. And we have 45% of DAP tokens staked right now to DSPs. So 45 million or 450 million DAPs are staked to DSPs currently. And out of those 450 million DAPs, I'd imagine more more than half of them are staking for rewards currently. So like back of the napkin math here, if we cut the um, staking to DSPs in half, because 
more dApps are going to the liquidity pool, or I guess you can't cut it in half, but you could deduct um, 100 million dApps. That would take the staking rate down to 30% from 45%. And that would make the staking yield on staking to a DSP that like gives back the rewards, kind of like Blocks or DAD or um, I guess those are the two big ones, Shintai. Then the yield on DSP staking, I, I'm not sure what it is today, maybe like 5%, something like that. But if the stake percentage across all DSPs decreased by 100 million dApps because they're in the Bancor pool, then the staking yield on the DSPs are going to be about 9%. So I think for the liquidity incentive, because it requires all of those actions and locking your tokens um, as part of the, the mechanism, that it, it should be rewarded higher than staking natively to DSPs. Um, but how much higher is kind of what I want to put up for discussion here and just like what would a fair amount be that people aren't people who aren't getting that yield aren't going to complain about it too much and also have it not so low that people aren't even incentivized to go through all of the steps of crossing the bridge and staking the dApps into the bank or then staking them into the rewards contract and all that fun stuff. So what, I guess I could just open this up for discussion. Any feedback on the whitelist proposal or any of the governance that's passed recently, I guess I'll just open up the floor here for some feedback. Because I, I really just want to define the terms because the next the next governance proposal, one of the next governance proposals that go along with the Bancor whitelist is going to be how many dApps we're allocating towards the rewards pool, like specific amounts. And that's going to determine what the potential uh, yield is going to be for single side dApp stakes. And I, I really would prefer to not be the one to make the decision. I'd like a lot of community feedback here. Come on, guys. Uh, I have a question, Zach, or, or kind of feedback. Uh, I see that yeah. uh, in the channels you've been proposing, um, you've been writing the proposals, uh, ex expanding on the proposals, answering the questions, uh, but that it seems like the questions are are repeated by multiple people. Um, even just on the call right now, there's only eight people, and I think from the Liquid Apps team, it's half, maybe more than half. Um, do you think it would be good to to leverage the uh, uh, something like what uh, Eden is doing like the forms where you could go post and people who aren't able to participate in real time could go back and read uh, kind of getting a collection. If not, it seems like it's the same people who are asking the questions and the rest of, let's say, the, the community is not really present. But um, when you look at the voting, clearly they are present. They're just not necessarily participating in this call and or in the channels. Maybe having a better repository for uh, the discussion that occurred outside of Telegram might be good and might be encouraging for those who can't participate in real time. Seeing as we saw that, I guess, Eden has been successful at getting people to to, to switch over. Yeah, so like, um, like Bancor also has a forum. So like a threat, just threaded long form, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree there. I think whenever we were initially rolling out um, the governance, we, there was talk about using like a subreddit, but I don't think Reddit's a good platform for this because it doesn't allow you to have threaded conversations, like a th um, threaded replies and things like that. It's, and you can't um, separate a Reddit, a subreddit by category also. Like it's just one subreddit. You don't have breakdowns of um, tags or categories. So we would need a hosted solution, most likely. Like, I don't know what the common software is, but it seems like almost everyone uses the same thing. Mm, uh, yeah. It's, uh, What's it called? Do you know? Not Decrypt. Uh, 
I don't recall. There's a D in it. It's the, it's the one that, uh, that Gray Mass used. Discourse, yeah. Yeah, yeah Discourse. Uh, and Aaron from Gray Mass also made a post on the on the ES community forums saying that, like, um, I suppose they're welcoming uh, community projects to start their own forums. So if you check the EOS community forums, Vigor already did that. There's like EOS community yeah, forums. So that, slash Vigor. I thought about that whenever I saw Vigor doing that. But the problem is that I don't think it's a good idea to have that. I wouldn't put it in yeah. on an EOS community forum. That's the problem. Like that limits. Is, right? Yeah. Yeah. It limits. And then especially if there's going to be the Bancor folks and other folks outside of EOS, uh, that might actually throw them off or, or put them away. But the, yeah, I, I, going back to, I think using Discourse, that particular platform uh, would be good, or using the one that Bancor uses already would also make sense. There's also Node BB too, and Thomas from the Dad Group has started a Node BB group for um, for the Dad uh, of the Dad community, and Node BB also works well. It's pretty similar to Discourse, but has some features uh, that Discourse doesn't. But either would be good, and Thomas also knows yeah. how to use Node BB. I agree. And now that the um, the DAP Gov fund and everything was approved, so um, like anyone who voted on and saw the third party staking proposal, that's actually serving as the very first bounty made through DAP governance. And I'm sure we'll refine the process over time to make it a little cleaner, maybe come up with a template for the bounties, things like that. But th there should be two types of bounties, like one, is more of like a worker proposal. Like you have something that you think would benefit the DAP network and you could propose it yourself and say like you outline the scope of exactly what you're trying to build or develop or write. And then you put what you think it's worth and a schedule of payment, whether it's in advance or upon work completed, things like that. That's one type of proposal. And then the other type of proposals, kind of like the one I made where it's like, this is something the community has shown interest in. It's been discussed over and over. We're proposing it to get done, but like this whole process like requires like community involvement. Like the Liquid Apps team shouldn't necessarily be relied upon to build everything. And this is something that came up as an idea from the community. It wasn't something on Liquid Apps like roadmap of something that the developers are focusing on because there's a lot of other things going on. And we are hiring still, as a reminder, we are hiring devs and technical raiders. Um, but when things like this come up, like this is a community initiative, that's why there's a community bounty. And that kind of needs to be emphasized moving forward is like what, and, and we'll have the liquidity to do it soon too, because like you could actually, if you have to pay devs, for example, you could realize, um, well, I guess you, if you got the bounty upon work completion, it wouldn't really help you, but, um, you'd be able to pay devs or team or whatever you need to do to get that stuff done. But um, more, I figure what is, where is, oh, so with the bounties, I think a good bounty, like right now, there's been a few requests on the DAP governance portal. Like there's some features lacking for sure. Like it could be done much better. And with the um, third party staking, once that bounty is complete for the smart contract work, which most of the code's written, like in the proposal, you could see um, from the DAP air huddle contract, what, what's needed to be, like the logic is already there. It just needs kind of merged in with the governance contract. But once that's complete, um, there would still be a, ste a second step to it, which will require another bounty for a front end. Um, because if, if you guys, I'm pretty sure everyone on this call has used a um, DSP portal before. And on every DSP portal, it gave you the option of staking your DAP tokens or your DAP HODL tokens because all the portals were created like during the DAP HODL. So third-party staking is very similar where like you're still kind of staking DAP tokens, but it's it's going to be treated differently. Like you'd have to separate your stakes between a third-party stake and a direct stake. So if you have half your tokens in Gov and half your tokens outside of Gov, you're going to have two separate stakes to potentially the same DSP service package. Um, so it's just like a, a front end interface that'd be needed to make it simple. And that could probably be done on like the governance portal page itself. So like no one really has ownership of the governance portal. There's some open source code that I think we published through liquid apps and then Blockstart is currently hosting it. 
but there's really no like incentive model to maintain it or add new features. So there, there's been a lot of requests in the um, Telegram governance group about this, this or that should be added to the governance portal. But like when you think of like the incentives, like there's no one that's really incentivized to do it. So that would be another thing for bounties and things for the community to consider is like taking ownership of the governance portal. And some of this work isn't even necessarily DAP network work. Like it doesn't have to be smart contract. It could be like if you're a front end dev, like this is a bounty for you is uh, the governance portals. And then also the third party staking will be coming up. And then I guess the tie into this is hosting this forum. So I'm, I'm pretty sure for some people hosting this forum and spinning it up in the first place is like nothing. So maybe a small bounty or worker proposal for someone to kind of take ownership of that. Someone trusted in the community that's not gonna just disappear and turn off their hosting for it. Because like hosting a forum, it's like centralized, that's fine. Um, but someone actually has to host it. Someone has to use their own credit card to buy the hosting. Someone has to pick up the domain and own the domain. So deciding who that is, um, ideally someone from the community and not necessarily um, liquid apps because we're not we're not hosting the governance portal as it is. I don't see Ramon on the call. I see Jason on the call, but a DSP picking it up would probably be a natural choice. But this is all just stuff coming up. But I'm rambling. Uh, but I agree. We I wrote it down the discourse forum. Um, I'll bring it up in Telegram after the call. But um, I think a small bounty for that, whatever, at least to cover like the hosting costs and things like that shouldn't be that big because it's a pretty small job. It's not a lot of custom work, but I think we need to continue to think about um, what type, now that we have this inflation, inflationary change, like, yeah, we wanna fund liquidity incentives and get dApps on, on like multiple chains with liquidity. But the other thing we wanna do is we wanna incentivize and give more skin in the game to people contributing and people like making things better and people improving and like pushing things forward and maturing the DAP network and things, things like this uh, helps with that. Um, there's other things like yesterday I was talking to Tal about it and he brought up the idea of like a, an analytics dashboard that shows like almost kind of like Aloha EOS, how they have like the, the, um, the different pings and things like that and different metrics for each BP having something similar for DSPs to help. Uh, and th that could be kind of like phase zero of a potential future slashing mechanism, for example. Like once you define what the KPIs and metrics are of a DSP and the analytics that you're tracking, then the next step is like looking at it and saying what represents bad behavior and what represents good behavior. And then coming up with parameters that define what would um, require, not require, but what would deserve some kind of slash, for example. And these are all just hypothetical at this point, open for discussion, but um, I just want everyone to keep in mind that the governance fund is has a funding mechanism. Um, the inflation should be turned on within the next, I don't, I don't wanna give too many, I don't, I don't even have the timeline in my head myself because it's in, in the works, but hopefully in the next like one to three weeks, maybe. Uh, we'll have the inflation and then we'll have the funding, but we, we could put the proposals in sooner because like we know the funding will be there. So if the like the proposal like for the third party staking, I made it even though the inflation didn't change yet. But I just assume that by the time someone actually decides to take on the work and do it, that it'll be there by then. Um, and then there's the other thing is I, I just came up with that 100K DAP for that bounty. But if someone wants to take it on and they say 100k is too low i will do the work but for more then they can make their own proposal saying like this is um an amendment to proposal seven i think it was that i made uh suggesting the third party staking and they would just propose that i will build it on with this scope in this timeline for this amount of dap and then if they can well, that's. I'm just kidding. Uh, you're right. Yeah, but it, it's all token holder consensus. That's what I'm saying. Is I just want to make sure that my number was good. If my number wasn't good, 
then I would like, instead of it not being done, I would like to see kind of like a counter proposal. If someone says, I could do this work, you just under budgeted it and I'll do it for this much. And then the this is where order, I think the uh, forms would be better as well. It'd be easier to track. A hundred percent. Like I'm in full agreement with the form. hundred percent. Um, yeah, especially as this thing grows right now, we're all pretty much ES community people on this call. Uh, the most, most of the people in the DAP community are from the ES community, but as we expand, uh, to other communities and more chains, I feel like we'll get more participation and things can get messy really quick. It's e like, it's not too bad to keep track of in the, between the governance and the DAP channels, but for other people, it might be for me. It, just kind of used to it, but I'm sure a ton of information is getting lost because like you've said, like these same questions are coming up. So it's like, you can't expect normal people to scroll up a week and, and catch up on the entire conversation. So I agree. Governance forum makes the most sense. And then having like a, a bounties and worker proposal section, because that's the other thing is like, just like the, the best practices on Bancor, how like, the whitelist proposals up for community review within our community right now. And then the next step is to share it on their governance forum for open community discussion. Like before a proposal is ever made officially on chain, it should almost always be discussed somewhere. And the, the governance forum would obviously be the best place because you have threaded categorized conversations. Whereas in telegram, it's just, a giant fire hose of conversation. And if you're trying to follow one specific topic, it could be difficult. So I think the timing is right now that we have the, the funding mechanism in place and we got, we, we can basically the, the world is our oyster at this point. Like we could, we have a lot of flexibility in what we could do. Like everyone's open to suggest changes or propose work that should be done so I, I think it will require more thoughtful discussion around it. So it is really good timing for the forum. I agree. Um, do you, so have, uh, do you have a sense of time, Zach, uh, in terms of when you want to put that proposal up? Like how long will you, or do you have an idea of how long you'll uh, give for feedback until you either propose something or decide not to propose something? So I don't, my timeline for posting it to the Bancor forum is like within the next few days, because that's kind of non-committal. Still, it's posting it to their forum for feedback, because I want to see what their community has to say. Um, from there, like leave it there for a minimum of a week, but then from there, the only thing really holding back it being proposed on chain is having a better idea of the timelines on our end for um, pushing a governance proposal through that sets a specific amount for the rewards. Because once the whitelisting is approved by Bancor, like we need to have rewards contracts deployed. We need to have logic for bridging the tokens. We need to know how many uh, reward tokens are being allocated to the pool specifically. And that was kind of like one of my focuses for today is how many dApps do we allocate towards the Bancor pool? Because it's a very unique situation where the market can't decide itself what the, I mean, to an extent, the market won't be able to decide what the proper yield should be that's worthwhile because it's going to kind of be a static amount. We know there's going to be between 90 and 100 million dApps in the pool. So we pretty much decide in advance what the yield's going to be on this particular LP where that, that's unique for most pools. Because if we're doing this on Uniswap or doing it on DeFi box, we would just set the rewards and not really care what the APR is gonna be because the market would just decide what it's gonna be. Whereas in this case, I, I don't envision there being nearly as many um, dApps added to the pool beyond the co-investment as the co-investment itself. That's my expectation. Um, but it, so for timelines, it's really within the next, like. Posting it to Bancor within the next few days, posting it to Bancor for vote within the next week, week and a half. And then if approved, it'll just be a matter of having all of the contracts deployed, which 
Um, I don't know if we have specific timelines on that, but everyone on uh, our team that is involved with all of that, they're all aware of the scope and kind of on top of it, but I don't have a exact date of when everything will be completed and deployed on uh, Ethereum as far as like the reward. And we're also relying on other teams here too. Um, the impermanent loss protection insurance, for example, using a third party token, which is DAP in this case, that's being developed by a completely separate team, which is um, BBS, which is IL's project. Uh, I've shared some stuff about that, but they're developing some of the contracts also. So we're also working on their timeline for some of it. Um, but all of their work's open source. So like, if we need to make some tweaks here and there in advance before they're even done with it, that might be something that needs to happen. But there's a couple of different moving parts. So that's why it's really hard to nail down a specific date but definitely within the next month i would say like in, in pending any like unforeseen delays like just because of the process of the governance of having to be up for vote for a couple of days once approved giving it some time to implement i, I think within the next month is a fair estimate of when everything will begin but the proposal process as far as getting the whitelist approved that should happen sooner. Like once Bancor approves the whitelisting, that doesn't mean that the pool opens up the very next day. Like I've, I've talked to them about this and I said like with Steven, is he on the call? No. So I asked, I said like, if this whitelist gets approved, but then we are still a week or two away from having the rewards contracts deployed on Ethereum, like would we be able to set like or delayed a little bit because it would be really bad to turn on the single-sided staking before we have an incentive mechanism on our end that it, it's actually going to drive the actions that we want which is crossing the dap across the bridge staking them in the bank or then uh transferring your stake to the rewards contract um so if we don't have that ready then it doesn't make sense to start the single-sided pool yet because there's no incentives um so we would probably set a future date at that point like working with bank we're saying okay our con like your 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 dow approved this so that's great but we won't have the contracts deployed for another 12 days like let's set the start date for july x or june x so that that's kind of how i foresee this all happening is if once bank approves it if they approve it um i think we'll end up just setting a start date at that point because I, I'd imagine that they're going to approve it before everything's deployed. I'm, I mean, maybe it's really hard for me to predict on that because I'm not on the technical side here and working with them and explaining like the, the scope and things like that, but I'm just not clear on timelines or any kind of delays that might come up or curveballs that are thrown. So. It might be worth, um, writing a bullet list of what you just said, like basically a summary of, of the general roadmap of things, like very, very, very high level, uh, not being bound to that roadmap, but very, very high level bullet point list of, here's here are the different things, the different steps that uh, we foresee happening, and here's a general guideline. Maybe it's a month or maybe it's even a quarter, like it doesn't need to be that precise. But just to give an idea of what people can expect, um, you know, to happen yeah. i think that would probably strengthen the participation uh because people would see you know it's coming it's coming if you really don't want this to happen or if you want to give input you know it's coming and here's when it's yeah. coming um i think it would also probably help uh the bank community uh, to showcase that you know there's 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 coordination it's organized here are the different steps uh and here's the work that's being done in order to achieve that i think would give confidence on their side as well Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did a very. I know I'm just putting more work period. on your plate. No, no, I, I realize it, it, that it's it's fine. I, I I was on the same page whenever I posted the proposal. I, I outlined at least the short version of all of that. Like the pro as it says the process is to publish to their DAO form first for review, commentary prior to publishing the proposal for official voting, and blah blah blah. But we have the thing on our end too is defining the specific rewards. So all that's been approved by our governance so far is that we've, we're going to turn up the inflation 
and it's going to start accumulating until the rewards program begins. The inflation is going to accumulate, and that's going to bootstrap the impermanent loss pool, which mm. isn't really affecting the circulating supply because impermanent loss isn't all going to be like realized. Like there's going to be stakes that just don't necessarily leave the pool. Um, but we have we have to kind of have a backstop on the IL because like anything could happen with prices. Like BNT, well. The, the proposal is that DAP's going to cover the impermanent loss if the price of DAP goes up in relation to the price of BNT. So I guess the only thing, the black swan event here that would really mess things up would be if DAP moon too hard. And then then we'd have a lot of impermanent loss on our hands. But Well, and when you be... say moon too hard, you mean relatively wise moon too to, hard. To so if both so increasing fiat, it doesn't BNT really matter. Could BNT yeah, yeah. could dump just the same. Like I'm not. So it's relative to each other, right? And so the likelihood yeah. of that type of event occurring is extremely low. But I think the important exactly. part is that you're creating a backstop for it. So you actually, you're you're preparing for that unlikely event, anyways. Yes. Yes. Like that's why why I'm saying like people understand this, this reserves going to be have a lot of daps in it, but. I that's basically just planning for like a worst case scenario, which is actually a pleasant scenario. <laughs> exactly. For most people in the community. But the worst case scenario would be that the there's a big price shift in DAP and BNT. And that could happen because BNT goes way down or DAP goes up for any reason. The likelier so, scenario is that DAP, you know, even five X's or ten X's, which because it's it, it's so low in value that that's realistic, <laughs> versus Bancor, let's say, dropping by ninety percent while DAP is going up. So it's unlikely. Exactly, and if then so it's, it's, it's like more likely that BNT is, stays the same or halves while DAP is let's say five Xing. Yeah, and that's why with the Not modeling, knowing investment advice. Yeah, definitely not investment not financial advice. advice. But again, I think I think that's lost on people. It's not. I, I don't think people understand when you say the impermanent loss, loss protection, or I don't know how to call it, that extra additional feature. Um, it is really like covering as much as possible, even the unlikeliest of scenarios. Yes. So I, I think it really showcases how much thought is being put into this process um to as much as possible mitigate risk known risk obviously there's always unknown risk you can't know it. that's the whole point but the mm -hmm. the potential known risks are even being taken into account when making this proposal and they're taken into account from a data point of view um for determining how much tokens are going to be staked or how many tokens are going to be used in these in these pools um I don't get the sense, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't get the sense that people understand the level of depth of research that you've put into this, which is yeah, why there seems to still be reticence on those particular numbers. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe that's where the forms would come help out. Um, or maybe maybe actually people do get it, and all you need to do at this point, again, is go back, put your, your roadmap up, very general timeline, put it up for vote, and you're going to get the votes because people already agree. Uh, they're just waiting for the actual uh, proposal to be put on chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. If people aren't on these calls, I feel like there's definitely a knowledge gap. Um, that's why we put the recordings up, but not everyone's going to listen. I don't expect people to listen. So like, it comes back to the forum again, long form, uh, because things get lost in Telegram. People don't always go back and try to catch up on the days that they missed and not everyone checks every single hour like most of us probably do. It's also for records purposes. So if somebody is in the future in disagreement with what happened or um, you know, want to know how you came to that decision, having that forum to point back to is much easier than pointing back to Telegram. Mm -hmm. So for records purposes, it's, it's, it's better. But the likely scenario uh, is that people are okay with it and or they don't care and they're just waiting for somebody to take the lead. Mm -hmm. So for record purposes, we got to get to the first thing that like I really need help defining this because I don't want to be just coming up with a number myself. Like allocating rewards for the bank or pool, knowing that there's going to be a very specific amount of liquidity in the pool like it might deviate a little bit i know there's people with bnt that are going to stake more than the co-investment but i 
don't expect it to be like double or anything. So like what what do we target for here? Like how do we set well, like I, think I don't now by now in my opinion anyways people have had a chance to chime up if they're not in agreement with the numbers that you that you proposed. Um, so I never if, proposed a specific amount of reward specific to the, this particular LP. And we also need to consider the fact that this isn't going to be the last LP. No. So there, there's going to be like a, a, probably a Uniswap or a Sushi swap against the stable coin. That, that would make the most sense to create arbitrage volume. Um, so it won't be the last one, but it's the first one. And it, it's unique because of the IL protection. I was, just talking to someone about this this morning is there there's a big difference between getting um a, a yield with impermanent loss protection compared to just a yield while eating the impermanent loss protection yourself like uh, but there's a cost defense, to it as well so i think people need to realize that there's a cost to it it's not a free service yes um, right. And that's where I think maybe there's disconnect is people don't realize, or maybe they do, but essentially you're getting a little lower yield because some of that yield is going towards that insurance policy. You're basically buying insurance. That's what the impermanent loss protection is. Yeah. I mean, with, with the, the math I've done on the IO, it's, um, let's see if a token goes three X over the other token or four X against the other token, that's either a 13.4% in permanent loss or a 20% in permanent loss. So if, if you're an LP for an early project or a project with a low market cap with, with high upside, then even if your yield, like most new projects, whenever you see a new DeFi project, they all try to come out guns blazing with some high APR. So if you're getting 100% APR, but then the token moons, because it's a brand new project with a low supply, because of the impermanent loss, that 100% might turn into like 50% or 60%. Mm. But it says 100% on the sticker, and you think you're getting 100%, but that's not what you're going to realize. Whereas with Bancor, with the impermanent loss protection, you don't actually notice the impermanent loss because when you withdraw, you're made whole. So a 30% yield with impermanent loss protection, depending on the price movements that happened while you were in the LP, it could be equivalent to a much higher than 30% yield. It could be equivalent to a 50, 60% yield. And like that needs explained also if people are like, why is it so low? Because I don't think we want to shoot for some insanely high yield because there's not, there's definitely risk involved because there's third party contracts involved, but it's a lot less risk than being in a typical LP. You're never going to come out with less dApps than you entered with in, in, in because the impairment loss is covered in DAPs. And then if you get, uh, if the weight shifts and you have more BNTs, you could always swap back into 100% DAP. And you should always have nearly the exact same amount of DAPs as you went in with. Whereas that usually isn't the case with OPs. So on, and on some ends, there's think, a lot less like, risk. I think there is a reason though, they don't call it insurance because it, nothing is foolproof, right? We're still talking about DeFi. We're still talking about experimental tech so I yeah would, I, it I is really it is a certain it. level of insurance though it, so it's not know. insurance it's it's an insurance policy but the insurance policy parameters yeah but the insurance but policy I'll parameters are not are not I'll try to refrain everywhere from i'll try to refrain from, from like you know talking very much uh in a hundred percent vibe uh, you know, you for sure. Well, uh, an insurance policy is never a hundred percent. And Bancor calls it impermanent loss insurance. That's where I got my yeah. terminology. From. Okay. But but insurance policy doesn't mean that you're covered in every single circumstance. There's still parameters and guidelines from within that insurance, from from within where the insurance actually covers you. So defining those parameters is extremely important. But it is insurance within those particular guidelines within a and b you are protected to that certain extent so you are mitigating risks uh within a certain range uh, but even that i'm not sure people fully understand mm -hmm. the, the impermanent loss protection is a new relatively a relatively new 
development in the blockchain space. Yeah, and it's um, what I all built and building that we're going to be using to provide a permanent loss protection using our own token. I think it could kind of set a precedent for brand new projects. And that's kind of what I was thinking also is when these new projects pop up, they have very low market caps. So there's very high risk of impermanent loss, but yet at the same time, you still really need liquidity. Being able to very simply by deploying an existing open source contract, being able to take on the impermanent loss using a third party token, I feel like that's a pretty big innovation. But Benny's right though, if people should not expect that it is impermanent loss protection in full. It is impermanent loss protection within a range of variables uh, that yes, is obviously exactly. wider than no protection, but it is not foolproof. And, and I think to make that distinction is very important. Yes. Yep, exactly. Yeah, especially the way we're doing If the it token the drops by 99%, sorry, but there's something greater that cannot be protected. There is a cap for everything, right? Even exactly. Yeah. When you talk about an insurance for your house, it's up to a certain uh, amount. Um, and it's like that uh, here as well. Yeah. So that that's, I guess, the... Um, black swan or the not covered logic would be what happens if the impermanent loss is so severe and we have so many withdrawals that happen all at the same time that the impermanent loss reserve gets depleted that would be a, a circumstance where like but you just said what know, happens totally the reserve gets depleted there is no more reserve shit yeah. out of luck yeah I mean, that's so the reality of same, it. you can't sugarcoat that same, at the same time, like we don't have to figure it out today, but there should be like um, I don't know a, um, a phase out or an end game involved with it. So the way um, I always described his plan for his projects using the impermanent loss and protection using the BBS token, their plan is to make it temporary. They're going to cover the up. When I say the upside, I mean like the the non-BNT token going up in relation to BNT. The highest risk is early on when a project has a low market cap. Once that increases over time as the project matures and it stabilizes, then his plan is to like withdraw, like providing all of the impermanent loss protection, then just switching to the traditional Bancor model, which is their elastic supply where BNT covers impermanent loss on both sides. So there is like a phase out that needs to be um, determined, but we don't really need to do it right away because I feel like we'll be providing the IL protection for at least the first couple months to a year minimum. Uh, I don't know what our end game would be for that, but whenever we would phase it out, we eventually need to discuss, okay, if we phase out the impermanent loss protection and BNT is going to cover IL on both sides now moving forward, then like, what do we do with the reserve set aside for uh, IL if they weren't all spent. Like there, there's a lot of options. You could burn them, you could set them aside for something else, blah, 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 but we don't need to discuss that now. But there is the idea that eventually the LP, like uh, uh, after the impermanent loss is realized and like it stabilizes, that there may come a time where we're not using DAP anymore for the impermanent loss insurance. It'll be covered by BNT, in which case we don't need to worry about it because they have a dynamic supply. They, they built a token model around impermanent loss that makes it so that they won't necessarily have the same um, edge cases, I guess, as we would because we're funding the impermanent loss in a different way. We have a static number in a reserve somewhere that has to cover all of the IL, whereas with them, they could cover unlimited IL at the... Um, cost of diluting their token a significant amount, but that's why they um, have to approve every whitelist and co-investment from their DAO because they're able to limit their risk exposure that way. But we still haven't uh, gotten to the, oh, like the biggest thing I wanted to get was feedback on this damn yield. Um, and I, I still don't think we, we've, we've gotten that yet. Um, 
And it's not an easy answer. No one really wants to say anything. Like, I don't want to say anything because I don't want it to be too high or too low. I don't want to give the wrong answer. Obviously, as a token holder of any token, I'm playing with DeFi and I want the highest yield possible. But I also am looking at this from a token economic standpoint. We don't want to over dilute the supply and we don't want to under incentivize LPs either because um, this is going to involve a token lockup. So I, I, I saw uh, BBS, they have, um, they put up some demo pages uh, using these contracts that we're discussing for the rewards and incentives and then permanent loss protection. And one of the um, um, factors that go into what your yield's gonna be is the amount of uh, time you're willing to lock up your tokens. So I think on theirs, they do it by the quarter. We could do it by the month with, with a maximum at certain point. But I think the way the distributions should happen is pro rata based on um, your total stakes, your total amount of tokens multiplied by your like days until vesting or days until unlock or whatever. So that the longer you're locking, you'll actually earn a better portion of the yield than someone who's only locking for the minimum, which would be, I think, 100 days because that's the minimum for the impermanent loss insurance. So those two factors mean that you're going to reward the long-term holders more than the short-term holders. Um, so that's also going to factor the yields. So like whatever we say is like what's going into the rewards pool. Um, everyone's not going to get the same amount of rewards. It's going to be dependent on your lockup. And then further down the line, um, there will be proposed some sort of NFT gamification component, which will have multipliers for staking uh like DeFi NFTs, but that really shouldn't be in the scope of this discussion at this point. Like, because we could always change the rewards through future proposals, also. Um, but we need to just decide on like how to roll this thing out. Like, they could always start out high because, like, it's just like any other incentive program. You could always adjust. Like, they could be higher at first, and then that's the incentive to like move your tokens there. Because once you're there and once you're locked, like, there's no more cost. To doing anything so if the rewards uh drop a little bit after the first two or three months then it shouldn't be that big of a deal it's not like they would drop to nothing they drop to a very reasonable amount like this is all i don't know group consensus on it so that's the interesting thing too is like we have whales also so if you're a whale and you're an lp and you have millions of dap and all you care about is earning the maximum amount of yield possible you're probably going to want to vote the maximum amount of yield, even if it's not necessarily what's best for everything else. But that's something that could potentially happen also. So that's why I would kind of like to not make the decision myself, but I'll have a little bit of a input on it. But I, I it, it's just a tough thing to answer. I don't, I don't know what I've asked this question in the um, telegram group so many times is like, what amount would be the right amount for you to, personally go through these steps to participate which is register for the bridge cross the bridge stake to bank or then stake to the rewards contract all of that i did the math a couple weeks ago when eth prices were much higher and gas was much higher but there was there's going to be like a if things don't change i know they're a little bit lower now today and this week but if things went back to where the fees were like three weeks ago there's about a seven to nine hundred dollar cost in gas fees to just get your tokens into this reward pool um because there's been people asking like what about the little guy and they, they bring up uh, a, a dad DeFi strategy where it allow, allows like a vault to occur on eos where everyone pulls their dApps together and then through a dsp on ethereum they handle the staking and unstaking all that fun stuff which that's out of scope for DAP because that's a, would be a dad thing. But the thing to consider is that Ethereum's already a whales game. Like if you're a minnow, like it's not going to be profitable for you. So that's the other thing to consider is I don't have the math today because fees are a little bit lower, but you're still probably looking at four or $500 in gas fees just to get this thing set up so you could start earning yield on your LP. 
Um, and it could easily go up to 900 or a thousand dollars again if gas prices go back to where they were a few weeks ago. That's just what Ethereum is. It's not cheap. Like that, that's why like a lot of people in the US community talk so much shit on it because it doesn't make sense. It's like going back to the Stone Age. But we don't dictate where the liquidity is. And the liquidity is on Ethereum. And that's kind of the first place we're going to start. And we also have a unique situation with Bancor. There's no other AMM anywhere else in any blockchain that's going to be willing to fund $2 million of liquidity against your token. Like it just isn't going to happen. Like once, once we get that set up, that opens up a lot of doors for other AMMs because then like when we set up the Uniswap or Sushi Swap AMM, the second one, that one's going to require two tokens. Someone has to have dApps and then someone, that same person also has to have an equal amount of stable tokens on the other side. So because of starting with Bancor and having the advantage of them doing a co-investment, that means that everyone holding dApp tokens collectively are saving like $2 million that they would otherwise have to stake into liquidity if they wanted to participate. So that means $2 million are saved that could be allocated elsewhere. So if we do the stablecoin DAP pool, it should be a lot easier to get like a half a million dollars of depth with the right incentives because people didn't stretch themselves out too thin with their own liquidity and willingness to participate in all of this stuff because Bancor is basically subsidizing liquidity. Like that's probably the best way to describe it is they're helping like if approved, it's going to significantly bootstrap liquidity and do something that like otherwise wouldn't be possible unless unless there's some dap whales out there that want to put up 2 million dollars of liquidity in eos or eth or bnb or cake or some other token i, I haven't seen it but in, unless that person existed then bancor is the best place to begin um so that's why we're going to eth even though these fees don't all make sense um but i, I don't know why i got on that ramble we, we still haven't defined this rewards thing that I'm trying to figure out here. And then beyond that, the other thing to consider is, um, we talked about it last week, is we, in discussions with Bancor and the incentives, I originally wanted to incentivize single-sided BNT stakers also, because that would be the only way we could expand our pool, is by expanding the... Um, organic staked BNT uh, beyond the co-investment. But the Bancor team advised against that because it kind of breaks their token model because the incentive for staking BNT into a single-sided pool, the only incentive should be that that pool generates the most fees for the Bancor protocol and is revenue positive. They shouldn't be staking because they're getting subsidized with some third party token that's giving them a bunch of tokens for their stake, even if that pool is not generating uh, volume, because volume is what Bancor benefits Bancor because they collect fees on that. And that's actually what covers the impermanent loss protection uh, is pools like Chainlink and pools like ETHBNT. Those pools generate so much fees that they subsidize all of the other smaller pools that don't generate enough fees to cover their own IL. Um, so that's what they're looking at is fee generation. And that's what they should be looking at for where you stake your tokens. If you're a BNT whale, they want you staking your BNT into a single-sided stake into a pool that's generating the most volume and fees, not the one that's paying you in the most tokens of their token. So I kind of want to stick by that based on their recommendation. We could always add a reward later for single side BNT stake. But um, we need to consider that once this pool fills up, once we hit the single side stake cap, and if we're not incentivizing single side BNT stake, the only other way to keep adding liquidity to the pool would be to add both tokens. You have to have BNTs and dApps, which I know some people on the call have. So I think the best approach to this would be to have the rewards contract monitor. Um, if you have BNT staked, to then check if you also have DAP staked, because a DAP stake is treated like in a single sided stake, even if you had both tokens, the protocol treats it as two separate stakes. 
But I, I talked to David, who's working on the smart contracts for the rewards yesterday about this. And the idea would be that if you're adding DAP and BNT, then you would get rewarded for both. But if you only added BNT, then you're not going to get rewarded. And, and that could change in the future. Uh, we could just make a proposal and tweak that real quick. The contracts are going to be made flexible enough that they could handle both. But I, I think that's the best approach. And I guess I'm looking for some feedback to also agree with me or disagree with me on that, that that would be a decent approach to be able to make it so that like once the pool fills up, let's say I have a million DAP and 50,000 BNT, whatever, I don't know what the equivalent is of the other side off the top of my head, but I have both. If I'm only getting rewarded for my DAP side of that LP, then I'm adding twice the value for half the reward because I'm only getting rewarded for half my stake. So I think this is the best solution to that, to appease the economic model of Bancor while also incentivizing um, if someone if the pool fills up on the single side, it stakes, but people still want to add more liquidity that they're able to do so without it kind of not making sense because it wouldn't really make sense for half the yield and double the value. So I think this is the most ideal solution unless anyone has something better. And at the same time, I think if the pool's already 100 million DAP deep, that it doesn't really need to get much deeper. At that point, rather than trying to come up with all these ways to add more liquidity to the bank core pool, I think the focus and priority should be on let's expand and open up that second pool to create the arbitrage volume, because that's what Bancor actually wants is they want to generate trading fees. And the only way we're going to be able to deliver that for them is if we set up the second pool and make it deep enough in liquidity that large enough trades could happen that they're going to make sense with the Ethereum gas and economic models to arbitrage between them. So that's the other option is just do nothing about it. Don't don't incentivize BNT at all. But then that kind of limits the people that hold both because I know that there's a lot of crossover in the communities. And I don't want to punish people necessarily. Did that all make sense? Like these, these are the last two details that need to be defined, I think. Uh, it's not holding back proposing to Bancor, but it's what we need to define as our governance because we need to propose it on our end pending the Bancor uh, whitelist approval. But if we're just under the assumption that Bancor is going to approve it, then we need to um, define our reward parameters of how many tokens are being allocated to the reward specifically, and then how many how, how they're being directed, whether it's to DAP only, DAP and BNT equally, or DAP BNT and DAP, but not BNT alone. So those, those are kind of the options. And these are the last, as far as your roadmap, Eve, I got the notes here that this will be on the notes of these last final decisions. But these are the two things that need to be defined is how do we how do we handle the BNT stakers? And how many dApps do we allocate specifically for rewards of one or both of the tokens? Like the rewards are a guarantee, there's going to be rewards, it's just how much are the rewards? Has there been much? Yeah, never mind. I, I think it's good. Yeah, I think you've captured it well. Um, <laughs> it's just because I was going to ask a question, but it's going to lead into another 30 minute conversation, and I'm on another call, so I can't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to talk to a few people. I think getting this forum up as quick as possible. I think if someone could spin up the forum, and then they could probably just do the proposal afterwards and just be like, I'm paying 50 bucks a month in hosting just compensate me for it and that's fine i think the DAO would approve that or if someone just wants to do it they could do it because like right now i think ramon's hosting the governance portal and like he didn't ask for anything not everyone needs an incentive if they think that their token stakes enough or they're just doing it to do it but i know there's other people that um would probably only do it with the incentives and i'm fine with either but uh i i think the thing we all agree on is we need a forum. 
like it was brought up a couple months ago and it just kind of got lost on me but you know, i think it's important for token point. holders to it, know as so well important. yeah um, and, but token holders right now are getting dividends through the DSPs, right? The DSP packages. And yeah. I'm not sure everybody fully understands that you can't make money out of thin air. And so whenever you get those tokens and then you sell them, you're creating downward pressure on the DAP price. And so there's continual down pressure um, at the rate of roughly 5 or 6% uh, because of those uh, rewards that are coming in. And having a liquidity pool with a lot of depth, as is being suggested, essentially gives people a means to be able to uh, create passive income without creating downwards pressure to the extent that is being created right now. Uh, and so it is, it is a huge, huge, huge benefit if you're a token holder and you're looking for that yield to have that uh, Compared to another token that is is very very liquid with a pool that will have tons of liquidity, um, in the means in the ways that the bank core is set up, uh, I this this would be a huge 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 benefit uh, to the token holders. And so, in my opinion, this should proceed. Um, I think we've talked about it long enough. I think that those have shared those opinions, uh, their opinions uh, have done so eloquently. Um, I don't think that there's been any major red flags brought up. I, I would, if if I were you guys, I would proceed with putting up the proposal sooner rather than later at this point. That's my plan. So all these last few things that need to be defined, like they're not really holding back the Bancorp proposal. It's more or less internally how we handle everything once the proposal is approved. So yeah, I agree. Like it's time to push it forward because once it's approved, we could set a start date. Like we don't have to necessarily be ready the day it gets approved because our governance process takes time. Then, like I said, there's contracts in the process of being developed, some by liquid apps, some by third parties, some mm. else. Yeah. There's, there's multiple parties involved. So um, I see that a lot of the, the um, concerns that are being brought up, especially in the voting side of things, uh, our, our, our token holders that are saying, in order to be able to vote, I need to you know unstake my tokens and I'm missing a few days worth of rewards. Yeah. Those rewards are worth nothing if you can't sell them because there's no liquidity to sell into. And if every yeah. time you sell, you create downward pressure and because the pool is so, or the depth is so small that you move the token price significantly with even small sells. Um, so for those who have concerns that are being brought up, um, because they are missing out on a few days worth of rewards. Your rewards are worth nothing if there's no means to 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 sell those rewards. Um, and this is this really comes about to to provide an out for that to be able to solve that while growing the ecosystem. So, uh, yep. my opinion, um, they should be very supportive of this. But again, you put it up for vote, and you see whether or not people actually participate. They vote, and token holders uh, have the final say. And for these specific reasons you mentioned, that's why I'm, like, I'm solely focused on getting this bank core pushed through. And then, like I said, Uniswap or SushiSwap would be a good second stop, but there might be, there, there's also the third stop of like figuring out what we could do with DeFi box because the native, like it, it, the DSP inflation is happening on EOS. So it doesn't need to be the deepest pool, but it should probably be a little bit deeper than it is today. So that is going to, be like a third pool. So if I had to predict the future and as long as governance goes along with like what I think is best, it'd be Bancor and then another deep pool on liquidity against the stable coin. And then the third one would be DeFi box against EOS. If like it, that won't necessarily be a super, super deep pool, but it'd be deeper ideally than it is today through. It uh, may incentivize large token holders who are technically capable to arb between those pools as well. Um, exactly. And so it's another trading if, pair. If you have that's that's something that's missing right now is because there's only one pool to trade against. Well, you can't arb against one pool. You need multiple pools. Yeah. Um, and so if people are concerned that let's say putting adding more liquidity in DeFi box as a liquidity provider may exit your positions, you're able to offset those losses by arbing between the different pools. Um, and essentially, you can actually generate profit by doing this. These are these are well known, um, you know, st trading strategies, etc. So you're you're benefiting the ecosystem, you're benefiting yourself, and you're profiting from the arbing uh, opportunities as well. 
Um, and right now, that's not being created. That that's a that's an actual loss, a, 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 an opportunity loss. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as you're getting in, into the economics earlier of the downward pressure from the staking model, that's also a key differentiator with like the um, LP incentives because there's a lock mechanism. Like everyone is in the LP is at least committing to 100 days unless they don't want to IL, I guess. But the yield might the yield's going to be better than what anyone's getting from these rewards packages, but they're also agreeing to lock up like a significant amount of tokens to get those rewards long term. Whereas most of these staking packages have a 24 hour or even some of them have instant unstake. So you're really not sacrificing anything. You're you're getting like a five percent yield, but like you said, it, it it's not adding value to the network, whereas liquidity does add value to the network. That's the key difference. Mm. Like, I, I, ideally, I want to create incentives around anything. If people want to earn rewards, coming up with things that adds value to the network and incentivizes that activity through re rewarding them, that's not DSP staking. Like, I don't think we'll ever be able to get rid of all of the reward staking, but if we can minimize it, it improves the profitability of actual DSP services because well, and it's it not be an all or nothing thing either. Exactly. So you yeah. could split up your tokens into multiple accounts, have some that are lock up for the hundred days and get IL protection, have a portion that is more liquid so that you can actually exit your positions or you know, essentially play with them. Um, have some in DeFi box, have some in the DSP staking mm -hmm. themselves. And then again, you're creating your own ARB strategies as well. So you can do it manually. Um, those that are more technically savvy can do that automated. Uh, having those tokens and uh, having those tokens and having more pools created just creates more opportunities for everybody. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's right not now, all or nothing. Yes, right now it's very limited to one specific thing. And right now it's all or nothing. <laughs> There's yeah. one place. That's it. Yeah. All right. So we're 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 up over an hour. I didn't get. Any of my answers, like we said, we'll summarize this in uh, the text chat and hopefully get something. But neither of the two things I need defined still are going to hold back the whitelisting proposal. So I, I guess this is the announcement is like a couple of days. Like by the end of this week, that whitelist is going to be on the Bancor like forum. So we really need the feedback now uh, because other. Stephen from Bankware had some good feedback. I'm still uh, working on that. Something simple. He he brought up this NFT for BNT voters, but I don't think we need to really get into that on here because it's, I don't think you even need to go through governance necessarily. Um, I'm trying to think if I didn't cover anything. Um, so the big things that came out of this is one, like reemphasis. Let's get this forum going. Two outline step by step what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks so that everyone can be on the same page and be made aware and speak now or forever hold their peace um get the whitelist proposal out by the end of the week uh still undefined is the reward allocations for the bank core pool but that's not going to hold back the proposal itself um and then beyond that the third party staking is uh, open bounty that's so like you said as far as like the staking like doesn't um you're talking about the people in the governance lock up who are talking about the staking and unstaking how it's annoying and inconvenient um the proposals passed to make it less annoying and inconvenient for those people but at the same time as far as i know no one's like stepped up yet to say like i'm gonna like no one's been asking it just past the other day so it's early but so far no one's asked questions because i doubt anyone's going to be able to complete this bounty without probably asking a decent amount of questions about the contracts so that's why it's done as a bounty that needs to be a community effort on on that implementation because it's out of scope with i guess what our dev team was planning to build but if uh the third party staking is enough of a nuisance to certain people then I guess it's up to them to help, I don't know, spread the word of the bounty. I'll drop it in the ESIO. Now that it's approved, I'll drop it in the ESIO devs channel soon. 
Uh, but I don't think the proposal actually passed until probably the last day because I checked it over the week and then it wasn't passed. All right. Um, does anyone else have anything they wanted to bring up or ask about? I know we've gone a little bit long, but I could address any pressing concerns. All righty then. I guess um, this is a good spot to wrap up the call unless anyone speaks up last minute. Um, I'll uh, post a summary uh, based on my recollection and notes uh, after the call. And I will be available all day and every day moving forward in the chat. And if you guys want to have another voice chat before next Tuesday, we can just let me know. Happy to talk to anyone about these things because, like you've said, I probably understand it better than other people because I did a lot of modeling here. I have a lot of math in front of me usually when I'm talking here with my spreadsheet. I would share it, but yeah, maybe I should. Maybe that will help. Let me write that down. I have a spreadsheet model. I just got to delete a bunch of private stuff on it, but I, I think I could share it. Then you guys could tweak some numbers and figure out how I maybe have a better idea of how I came up with these numbers. But um, it's not really well documented, but I'll share it anyway and explain it the best I can. Um, yeah, no one's talking, so I, I guess I'm going to wrap this up. All right, guys, I'll talk to you guys uh, in the chat and text, and then we'll have uh, another call next week, and I'm happy to have one sooner if anyone has any pressing concerns. See you guys. Thanks.